have you ever begun a project which on the surface seems really simple, only to discover once you get into it that it's quite complex? This is the case with the sixth commandment. Yes, we're back to Exodus after a couple months of hiatus. Um, right in the middle of the Ten Commandments. Now remember that these commandments not only give us parameters and laws that we're to obey, but they also reveal God's character. They reveal his nature. He's the foundation of all these commands. The first four commands deal with the human relationship with God. So we're to have no other gods before him. We're not to make any images and we're not to take his name in vain, and we're to honor his Sabbath day and keep it holy. From the fifth through the tenth commands, they deal with interpersonal relationships. And the first of those was the command to honor father and mother. Now, the sixth command that we get to today is one of the most easily recalled. You know, if you ask kids, you know, what are the Ten Commandments? They might for those who haven't ever memorized them, they're going to fudge around here and there, but most likely they're going to remember at least two. The one that their parents always tell them, which is, do not lie. And, um, and then the one that is the lowest common denominator for measuring human goodness. And that is the sixth command, do not kill or do not murder. Um, that's the one that we default to, don't we? And I think part of that is because at least in our minds, that's the easiest one to keep. So we may look at all the others and say, mm, you know, I don't know if I can be trusted here, there, but there. I've never killed anybody. You know, I've never killed anyone. So I can always fall back on that as the lowest common denominator of good. And as with the other commands, as children of God, we have to work through the process of what it means to keep this command. At first glance, it it seems so simple. As the NIV renders it, you shall not murder. But it's actually more challenging than that. And we'll see that its foundation lies in the authority and character of God. This command is actually quite complex. What makes it complex? The first aspect that, that, that contributes to the complexity of this command is how short it is. In Hebrew, it's only two words. So if we were trying to render it, to give it the same impact in English as it would have in Hebrew, it would be no killing. Okay? Or no murdering. We'll get to the translation of that in a moment. And again, that might seem really clear. No killing. But it only takes a very short examination of the broader context to find apparent conflicts, doesn't it? Because there are numerous times in the Old Testament, which is the wider context of this command, when God not only sanctions killing, but even commands it. He tells his people to execute members of their community who commit certain capital crimes. And that comes quickly, just in chapter 21, the next chapter in Exodus. There's a list of capital crimes for which people are supposed to be put to death. He sends his people to war against other nations. And sometimes he commands them to wipe out entire populations, not just the enemy combatants, that terminology that we've learned in the modern era. Not just the soldiers and warriors, but everything and everyone. Something else that makes this, this command complex is the Hebrew word itself that's used in this command. The word is... Um, Ratzah. I know that doesn't mean anything to anybody, but it's important for us to know that this is not the most common word used in the Old Testament for killing. Some versions, like the King James, have translated it, kill, thou shalt not kill, while most more recent translations render it murder, like the NIV, you shall not murder. Murder makes it easier to understand in English to a point but it gets challenging because in the Old Testament, the same word, ratzah, is used to describe involuntary or accidental killing as well, something that is clearly not murder. And at the same time, we do need to understand that this word is almost always used, now this is important, bear with me on this, 
this word is almost always used to refer to the killing of someone who is not an enemy of the people. Okay, so it's not used to describe killing in battle, nor is it used to describe execution for a crime. For those two situations, execution for a crime or or killed in battle, the English Bible translations will, will render that word as put to death. So as you're reading your English Bible, um, if you'll notice that if the word is murder or kill, that's usually going to refer to someone being killed who is not a enemy of the people of God. Okay? For all other instances, it will usually be translated as put to death. So if someone is supposed to die for capital crimes, they will be put to death. If it's um, a war, an enemy of the people, um, or a, uh, a nation that God is, is wiping out, then the terminology would be used, put to death. So we're left with some ambiguity relating to certain aspects of the application of this command. In the Old Testament, at least, it was not understood as a call to pacifism. And at the same time, in God's eyes, in the Old Testament, at least, there was clearly legitimate and illegitimate killing. And that fact leads me to focus us in on the foundation of this command, which is this. In the sixth commandment, God stakes his claim to ultimate authority over all life. Jesus consistently, in the New Testament, takes the outward adherence to commands, particularly in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, from that outward focus to the inward focus of the heart. We've heard this before. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I say to you that anyone who, look, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. When it refers to murder, he says, you have heard that it was said, do not murder, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother, anyone who says to his brother, you fool, is in danger of the fire of hell. So Jesus is taking that command that, and, and taking it, saying not only is there an outward necessity of obedience, but there's an inward heart issue as well. So in this command, God stakes his claim to ultimate authority over life. And for us to understand that a little more clearly, let's emphasize a different word in English. Okay, because we're talking about God's authority here. So instead of saying, you shall not kill, think of it this way. You shall not kill. Now I'm not arguing with this that God is a God who celebrates death but rather clarifies that the authority is his. You, meaning humanity, you shall not kill. Outside of God's express intent and will, you shall not kill. You shall not take upon yourself that responsibility which lies only with God. As I said earlier, there are times in Scripture that God commands the killing of people and even of nations. And that's so hard for us to accept, isn't it? That's very difficult to understand. And isn't that often an argument that non-believers use against us or even against God? How can, you, you talk about God being good and holy and loving. How can he be good if he wiped out entire people groups and nations? This is where we must submit to the authority and sovereignty of God. And it's also where the human heart most rebels. Because we look to God and we say, God, you say you're good, but look what you did. Look at these people you killed. And then you give us this command, you shall not kill. You shall not murder. How is that consistent? It's not consistent. Because we are not God. And I know that this illustration that I'm going to use right now will probably not satisfy us. It won't. Let's be honest with ourselves. There is no explanation that we can give for this apparent dichotomy 
that's going to satisfy humanity. Right? But I, I don't know if you've ever taken a loaf of bread out of wherever you keep it, and there's some mold on that bread. Now, you have a choice at that point. If you're my wife, you throw the whole loaf of bread away. If you're my mom, you cut off the part that's moldy, and you throw that away, and then you use the rest. Is it possible, brothers and sisters, is it possible that when God brings judgment, as he did in the Old Testament upon entire nations, that in his sovereignty and in his knowledge and in his vision, that was an act of purification and actually salvation for the earth. Not allowing a particular brand or kind or depth of evil to proliferate. I and mean, that's what God did in the flood. You remember? God wiped out all the population of the earth at one point. Why did he do that? Because every thought of man's heart was violent all of the time. That's what he says in Genesis. And it wasn't done ignorantly. Remember that description with Noah, God comes down. It says God comes down and he looks and he sees and he experiences and he takes note of the state of humanity. And he says there is such danger here. There is such perversion. There is so much brokenness that I've got to guard humanity from this. So these explanations, I want you to know, I'm not arguing that they're wonderful and perfect and make everything okay, but we do need to understand that the issue at stake is God's sovereignty and God's right and God's authority, not ours. And the sixth commandment states that God is the one who has authority over life. And to those who raise that question, particularly non-believers, I think a question that we can ask them, that you can ask them is this. Why does life matter? If God is not who he says he is, or if God doesn't exist, why should there be any desire to preserve life? Why? What makes life intrinsically good? In fact, from an atheistic perspective, we could argue that genocide and murder and killing is an evolutionary good. Survival of the fittest. Wipe out the weakest. Wipe out those who are the least able to survive, that are using up our Earth's resources. And let's make our species stronger and better. What gives life value? Why is there generally a consensus among all people that murder and killing is wrong? Whether they're believers in God or not. I believe it comes from God's character that he has put into creation. And if God is a creator of life and has all authority over life, then all life belongs to him. We may not like or understand his actions at times, but we must acknowledge that this is his right, not ours. Ethan is now 16, my son, and he has uh, outgrown his obsession with Legos. But um, for many years of his life, Legos were some of the most important things to him. And I remember every time he received a new set or had purchased a new set with his own money that he had saved up, immediately he would go and he would build it. And some of these were, were quite intricate and quite large. And I remember the, the finished product would be done and he would call us in to see it or he would bring it out to us wherever we were and he would, we would ooh and ah over it and see how cool it was. And then, within 10 or 15 minutes, he destroys the whole thing. And I remember several times saying, what are you doing? Because I know with all the other Lego pieces he has, if he takes that thing apart, it's never going to be rebuilt the same way again. Because those same pieces will never be found. They all get mixed together. But that's Ethan's joy and because he wants to create new things and other things. So I don't mean to cheapen life by comparing it to a Lego creation. Okay? But I do want to say, like, that Lego set, that's his. 
I might not like that he's going to destroy it because I like the way it looks. I think there's value in that. But it's his. He has that right to take it apart if he so chooses. When a human takes the life of another human, that is profoundly serious because we are destroying something that is not ours to destroy. Only God has that authority. And if any human who takes that initiative upon themselves to end the life of another is transgressing into God's authority and God's purvey. Now, at this point, I'm not getting into arguments of capital punishment, whether capital punishment, the death penalty is right or wrong, nor am I addressing killing in war or even just war theory, because the command doesn't go that far. This command establishes God's authority over all life. At the beginning of all things in the Garden of Eden, there were two trees in the middle of the garden. Do you remember that? The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. From which tree did God say of those two that humanity, at the time Adam and Eve, should eat? The tree of life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the one from which God prohibited Adam and Eve to eat. Why was this? Because if they ate of it, they would die. So at the very beginning of creation, we see that God has a heart that is in favor of life. Let them have life. Let them have all they want and all they can take. Eat everything you want from the tree of life. Satisfy yourself. Fill yourself. Live but don't touch this tree because I want to protect you from death. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. After Adam and Eve sinned and all creation fell, God banished them from the Garden of Eden. And this seems harsh and vengeful. Doesn't it? I mean, we, we read that story, this, the, the, the angel with the flaming sword set there at the entrance of the Garden of Eden so that they couldn't come back in. And that seems harsh and judgmental to us. But again, this is an act of God's mercy. Why? God says, there in Genesis chapter 3, that now that mankind is broken and sinful, allowing them to eat from the tree of life would mean that they would live forever in that brokenness. In His mercy, God limits the brokenness and removed them from access to the tree of life. And once sin enters the world and humanity was cut off from the tree of life, it doesn't take long for murder and killing to make its way onto the stage, does it? The first generation after Eden, we see the first murder. The first recorded murder in history is, is when Cain, the elder son of Adam and Eve, kills Abel his younger brother. Do you see how profoundly anti-life the serpent and sin are? God gives life, the serpent tempts him to sin, and sin brings death. Sin brings murder. Because sin is always going to attack what is most precious to God. God creates a culture of life, the serpent perverts it into a culture of death. But as we know today, God's mercy does not end with limiting the lifespan of mankind. No, because he is the creator and sustainer of life. He acts to revert it, to redeem it, to bring life out of death. And this we see in the person and work of Jesus Christ. John 10.10 10 was a verse that I had to memorize as a kid. Jesus sets up the same dichotomy in that verse. The thief comes only, and by thief he's referring to Satan, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus says what? I have come that they may have life and have it to the full or have it abundantly as the King James Version translates it. I believe most of you know how Jesus went about the restoration of life. He died our death so that those who believe in him and receive him and surrender to him may live his life. His eternal never-ending, forever joyful life. 
Last Sunday, we read the book of Revelation out loud. And the last chapter there, the first five verses of Revelation chapter 22, we read a description of God's restored creation. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. You see that the river of, the river of life is flowing out of the very person of God. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night, they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Note how the tree of life brackets all of history. It's there in Eden, and it's there in the New Jerusalem, and its leaves are for the healing of the nation. What is absent in the New Jerusalem? the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree that brings death. Genesis 2, the tree of life. Revelation 22, the tree of life. I want to close this morning with some thoughts about how we obey and honor this command. If God is the supreme authority over life, that means he's also the supreme authority over death. That means there's a positive and a negative to, to obeying this command. What we don't do and what we should do. And there are many, many different ways to apply this. So I'm not going to be able to cover even a very, very small percentage of that. But how do we honor and respect the claim of God to total and complete authority over life? I think the primary way is a positive way. It's to acknowledge his authority over my life. If God already owns all life, then those of us who claim to be children of God, who claim to believe in Jesus, we have a double reason to submit. If the command not to murder underlines and accentuates God's authority, then it's not enough just to apply it to death. We have to apply it to life as well, to surrender, to laying my life before God himself. Acknowledging his right to determine my direction, my disposition, my choices. And so that is a question that is laid out to us this morning. Have you surrendered to God's authority over your life? Have we? And just to be clear, you know, that, that act of surrender, that has a starting point, but it doesn't have an ending point. Um, it seems that God does this in his people. He calls us to surrender about a certain issue or in a certain area and we surrender to him and we breathe deeply with relief after that. We walk through that hard time and we're so glad we've surrendered. And then something else comes up. And then again, God asks us, will you surrender your life to me? I am the creator of your life. I am the sustainer of your life. I am life. Will you surrender to me? So ask yourself, or, or maybe we should allow the Holy Spirit to ask us, is there an area of my life that I need to release, that I need to surrender to God and say, yes, yes, Lord, it's yours. My life is yours. Scripture puts it this way. You've heard me quote this verse many times. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. So no killing is the negative command. The positive would be all living. All living. Live. Live through Christ. Surrendering 
our wills, our thoughts, our desires, our future, all to the owner, creator, and sustainer of this life. There, there is one issue um, also that I want to address. One way that contemporary humanity insists on striving to negate God's right to create and uphold and determine life. In my understanding, the fundamental, most basic and primal way that modern humanity disregards, ignores, and flaunts their rebellion against God's authority over life is through abortion. I know that's not the only way. Believe me. And I know that for some of you, maybe perhaps for many of you, this is such a tired issue. And you're thinking, Nathina, really, you're going to bring this up again? It's been around for so long, it's kind of become, in many senses, many cases, kind of passe. It's boring and it's irrelevant. And in Brazil, after all, it is still technically illegal. And so um, there are many more exciting issues that um, the secular world even will approve of. Um, in, in, in being, um, in guarding life. So why are you bringing this up? I know that there are many other ways that humanity rebels against this command. I know that there is oppression and persecution that devalues life. There is indifference to the suffering of others that likewise reveals in our hearts a hardness toward the preservation of life. But no other practice that I'm aware of strikes the most vulnerable of people in quite the same way. No other activity that extinguishes life is so socially acceptable and easily accessible. Over this past year, no other violence has cost the world 42 million lives. That's the estimate for 2018. 42 million no tsunami or famine or flood or war came even close. In fact, if you added up the deaths from all of those events in 2018, none would come even remotely touch the rebellion of abortion. And all mostly accepted, mostly legal, often celebrated. So we need to ask ourselves a question as the church of God. Do we honestly believe that the blood of these children does not cry out from the ground to the Lord along with Abel's blood? This morning we heard from reading from Matthew that prophecy in Jeremiah about Rachel weeping for her children because they are no more. That that. It, that event of Herod putting to death those boys in, in the Bethlehem area, we often hear that referred to as the slaughter of the innocents. Scholars today put that, it, it's a guesstimate, you know, how many, how many children did that involve? Maybe 15 to 30, somewhere in there. That blood cried out to the Lord. David wrote that God knit him together in his mother's womb. You've heard that verse before from the Psalms. That God knit him together in his mother's womb. Abortion does what? Seeks to tear apart, literally at times, in the womb. I just want to encourage us, brothers and sisters, to not grow weary in fighting for life. And as we fight for life, we fight for our God and his right over all human life. And I also want to say clearly, for those here this morning, who have participated in some way in an abortion or multiple abortions, perhaps. God does reach out to you and offer his healing and his forgiveness. And I remember vividly, I'm not sure exactly how many years ago it was, but on, Christ, on Easter Sunday morning, Laura Anisi stood right up here and she shared about her journey from condemnation and guilt to forgiveness and freedom because of her participation in, in having two abortions. So this is not the unforgivable sin and you are invited to receive that forgiveness and restoration of God. John 1 describes the advent of Jesus like this, in him was life and that life was the light of men. The enemy longs to keep us in the darkness of death. The Lord Jesus wants to bring us into the light of life. As a church, we support a, a mission, an organization called Servi, 
Maybe you've seen it on the screen, you've read about it in your bulletin, you've heard about it. The closest we can get to describing what this is in English, and for those of you who have spent any time in North America or even some in Western Europe might have an understanding of what this is, but it's a crisis pregnancy center. It's a, a place that is on the front line of this battle to preserve life. And, and women, usually very young women who are pregnant, and for whatever reason, their life is in upheaval or chaos, and they're contemplating abortions. This place, Servi, brings those girls, brings those ladies in, provides counseling and medical care and love and provision, all in an attempt to lead people to Christ and to preserve life. Because God is a God of life. Now here's the last little challenge I want to put out there. Abortion and the fight against it would kind of be like the negative side of this command. Now I want us to look for a moment at the positive side. And this is not meant to be condemning. This is not to, to point a finger. But this is something that I'm going to say to those of, those of you who are married, those of us who are married, and um, those of you who, by God's grace, will be married someday. Are you open to life? And what I mean by that is, have you, have you given your fertility to God? Have you surrendered that to Him? And friends, again, please hear me. This is not an argument saying that everybody needs to have a large family. It's not saying that every couple needs to you know, have to buy a van. That's, that's not what I'm saying. The question is a question of the heart. It's not about outward um, boundaries. It's about inward surrender. Have you sought the Lord about that? In other words, have you said to God as a married couple, Lord, we are willing for you to reproduce life through us as you want to do. Seek Him about that. Don't just make assumptions. It's interesting to me that we, we seek the Lord's will in so many different areas. And often, that's one that, as evangelicals, we don't. You know, we have our life plan. We have our trajectory mapped out before us. And we really don't want God to be involved with that. But we'll seek Him about many other things, about finances, about uh, jobs, about decisions. But that's one that we kind of leave off to the side. And I just want to invite you again to revisit that. And I love the fact that God, God has uh, blessed Calvary with lots of life in many different ways. And just this morning, looking around, I, I don't want to draw undue attention, but I, you know, some of you are obviously pregnant. Um, some of you are not so obviously pregnant, yet are. And God's multiplying life. And, and that, is a, that should be a joy to all of us. That should be a joy to all of us. I remember a friend of mine once who um, was uh, told me, shared with me that he and his wife were pregnant with their third child, I think it was at the time. And I was ecstatic. I gave him a huge hug. Congratulations. He's like, you're the only person that's reacted that way. I said, what do you mean? He said, everyone else is kind of like, oh, three, huh? The first one, everyone's excited. By the third, they're like, eh, this is old news. But it's life, brothers and sisters. This is life that God's created. It's his image. And he was the one who said the very first command given to mankind was a pro-life command, be fruitful and multiply. That was the first one given. And lest you say, yeah, that was before sin, he repeats it after the flood. Be fruitful and multiply. The answer of the, you know what the, <laughs> so much of modern thought is directed at limiting the image of God on earth. Right? What's the problem with earth? Too many people, too much image of God on earth. So on one hand, we have God saying, be fruitful and multiply, multiply my image on, on the earth. And then on the other side, we say, there's too much image of God on the earth. Wipe it out, kill it, stop it, abort it, limit it. So an invitation to us this morning. An invitation, first of all, to surrender our individual lives to the Lord so that his life will live through us. Because he is the author and perfecter of life. And secondly, for those of us who are married, 
or who will be married someday to, to lay that before the Lord and say, Lord, what do you want to do in us? What, what do you want our family to look like? Not just what I think or want, but what do you want it to be like? And then thirdly, continue the fight where we have an opportunity to preserve life, to contribute to that, whether it be in prayer, whether it be in financial support, whether it be in, in speaking with others, then let's take that opportunity. And all of this together communicate, you know, to, to work toward upholding and obeying this command and honoring God and His authority over life. Jesus walked the path of death so that we could walk in His life. And nothing illustrates that so clearly as the communion table where we proclaim his death. You know, for every life, every life requires an aspect of sacrifice. I've never been through it, but I'm pretty sure that any woman who has ever been through labor will acknowledge this fact. And men, we will agree. To every life, there is an aspect of sacrifice. For parents to love and raise and invest in children, there is, that demands sacrifice. When Jesus wanted and planned in the almighty sovereignty of God to give life to humanity, it required sacrifice. And he provided that sacrifice. And we honor him and we worship him this morning for that truth. For those who will be serving I would, um, the elements, I would invite you to come on forward. Um, and as we prepare the table, I would invite the rest of you to a time of contemplation, just a couple minutes, it's not going to be very long, to think about these things, to think about the God of life, to meditate on him, and to open yourself up to his life.